Hey, hey, welcome to episode five of the Latter day Disciples podcast. I am so excited to share this week with you five wonderful signs of the times. You know, we tend as humans to be unequally focused on negative things at times. And I think the signs of the times might be one of those places where it's just so easy to see and remember the negative. This is very psychological. Our brains are somewhat hardwired to do this. But our mission at Latter-day Disciples is centered on uplifting and on empowering And that means that we want to give equal or even more attention to the positive elements of living in the last days, of which there are so many. I am called to remember that quote from President Nelson that we all know at this point by heart when he said that it won't be possible to survive spiritually without the constant influence of the Holy Ghost. But I'm less certain that we remember what he said immediately before that. He said, Our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, will perform some of his mightiest works between now and when he comes again. We will see miraculous indications that God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, preside over this church in majesty and glory. Let that sink in. Think of the works that Christ has done in the capacity of our Savior and Redeemer. And I would expand that to say in the capacity of being a creator and being a lawgiver. And yet some of his mightiest works have not happened yet. That is what we are talking about when we say that there are great things ahead for those who love the Lord. Because Christ is just getting started. And that's (laughs) mind-blowing. And we're going to see today how some of the prophecies that have been given regarding our times are truly mind-blowing in the most amazing ways. So I wanted to overview today five signs that I personally can't wait to see. Some of them are already underway, some of them are not, they have yet to be fulfilled, but all of these I hope will serve to broaden the horizons in your mind of what you have to look forward to and what a privilege it is to be on the earth at this time, more especially to be a disciple of Christ at this time, and most especially to be covenanted with Christ at this time and to have the opportunity to participate in this if we so choose to do so. So sign number one, we find this very simply stated in Doctrine and Covenants section 88 verse 73. And the Lord says, behold, I will hasten my work in its time. This is sign is in accordance with what I will call the law of equal and opposite. There will be intensifying evil in the last days. We know this. And to combat this and provide the appropriate positive opposition, because there must be an opposition in all things, not just that there must be evil in opposite to good, but also that there must be good in opposition to evil. And so because of this, we are also going to see an intensifying righteousness in the last days. Particularly, we see this when it comes to the work of salvation, Christ's work. His work and his glory is to bring to pass the immortality and the eternal life of man. That is achieved through the work of salvation, particularly the work of salvation that we participate in for both sides of the veil. So let's talk about on the other side of the veil from where we are right now. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, it says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, 
and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. The mountain of the Lord's house is symbolic for a couple of different things, the church in general, but also especially for temples, the literal Lord's houses upon the earth. Right now, we have 170 dedicated and operating temples. We have an additional 45 that are under construction and 50 more that are announced for a total of 265 temples. I think we take that for granted, especially maybe some of us who live in the United States and especially in the Utah-Idaho region where we have a temple every 15 minutes, it seems. There are places in Utah where you can literally look and see six to ten temples from, you know, just standing in one place. But this is miraculous. Think about what it meant to the early saints of the restoration in Kirtland and in Nauvoo of how important it was for them that they were going to have access to this and the sacrifices that they were willing to make to build houses under the Lord to receive their own saving ordinances and also to redeem their dead. This is monumental and we're going to continue to see this upward trend. If you haven't been able to tell President Nelson is very much on top of this, announcing 20 new temples in a single conference session. That is historic. And the Lord will continue to make available his houses to his righteous disciples so that we can go in and serve and do the work for those who are deceased and who cannot do it themselves. And that work will continue to hasten up into and through the millennium. We also see this effort expanded on our side of the veil through missionary efforts. I remember distinctly where I was during the October 2012 General Conference. I was in my very first apartment attending BYU as a freshman. I was surrounded by my roommates and I was painting my nails. I was sitting on the floor painting my nails listening to President Monson talk about these righteous 18-year-old boys who they had called on missions and how well they were performing in the mission field. And I was there when he announced that young men could now serve at the age of 18. And then when he announced that young women could serve at 19. And I burst into tears because I was less than six months away from my 19th birthday and I wanted to serve, I think, on a, on a level that I didn't truly understand at the time. And so I got to participate in that first wave of missionaries that came after that announcement. There was a 41% jump in the number of serving missionaries from 2012 to 2013 because of that. And the numbers have declined a little bit, but mostly are maintaining. And I know several wonderful missionaries who are serving right now. Also, the mission age change served a second purpose in that in allowing more of his sons and daughters to serve a formal mission, I think that our generation is better prepared than any other to do the work of what I would say everyday missionaries or member missionaries. And that is a privilege that we get to participate in and that we've been trained to do. Our mission did not stop after 18 months or two years. Rather, the Lord gave so many of us and has given us and will continue to give others the opportunity to be trained in that sort of a sphere to do the work that is yet to be done on this earth. We know that the gospel must go forth and penetrate every nation, every people, every language, every place before the Savior can return. And everyone must be given that opportunity. And I'm so grateful that we have had the opportunity to be trained for this. And now we have the responsibility to do this work. I did note that there was a recent church press release that we have called an additional 164 new mission leaders, which was up from 105 in 2021. 
just so exciting to see this expansion and the onward march that is this church. And I would also note that other religions have seen precipitous decreases in membership lately. There was a study recently released on the amount of religiosity among Americans and Christianity is hovering around 50% down from something like 61% a decade ago, which is a huge drop. And I am grateful, although unsurprised, to see that our faith we have roughly maintained between the member of converts and those who have decided to distance themselves and no longer affiliate with our church, it's somewhat struck a balance for now. These things will continue. We can expect to see more miraculous events like this in the future that will perpetuate the saving work that the Lord is doing upon the earth. And it's so exciting. Anyone who was there when the mission age changed could tell you that there is a palpable spirit of urgency in that moment. And I think we hear it every time President Nelson speaks now. And that's so exciting to be a part of, is is the Lord's hastening of his work to oppose the evil that also exists today. Okay, sign number two. And this is probably the one that I am most captivated by, and that is the building of New Jerusalem. Now, we know from modern day revelation that this city, this world capital that will preside along with old Jerusalem will be built in Jackson County, Missouri. We find that in Doctrine and Covenants 57, one through two, where the Lord says, hearken, O ye elders of my church, saith the Lord your God, who have assembled yourselves together according to my commandments in this land, which is the land of Missouri, which is the land which I have appointed and consecrated for the gathering of the saints. Wherefore, this is a land of promise and the place for the city of Zion. What I find so interesting about New Jerusalem is that it's going to be a parallel to the city of Enoch in a lot of ways. The city of Enoch was similarly raised among very wicked and evil and terrible conditions. But under the direction of a prophet, one who walked with the Savior, the people were able to establish a nearly perfect city that was a refuge, it was a safe place, it was welcoming, it thrived among otherwise degenerate conditions on the earth. And that's going to be the same thing when we build New Jerusalem. First and foremost, we know that this will be a place of safety. We learn this in Doctrine and Covenants section 45, verses 66 through 69 that say, And it shall be called the New Jerusalem, a land of peace, a land of refuge, a place of safety for the saints of the Most High God, and the glory of the Lord shall be there, and the terror of the Lord also shall be there, insomuch that the wicked will not come unto it, and it shall be called Zion, and it shall come to pass among the wicked that every man that will not take his sword against his neighbor must needs flee unto Zion for safety, and there shall be gathered unto it out of every nation under heaven." And it shall be the only people that shall not be at war one with another. And it shall be said among the wicked, let us not go up to battle against Zion, for the inhabitants of Zion are terrible, wherefore we cannot stand. And it shall come to pass that the righteous shall be gathered out from among all nations and shall come to Zion singing with songs of everlasting joy. I love how these verses indicate that this land will be a land of safety, not just for members of the church, but for righteous people of all faiths. That is consistent with the God that I worship, that he will not discriminate based on religion. Freedom of religion will still be established in this land. All people, anyone who does not want to fight, who does not want to fear for their life will come to Zion and will find safety there. There's a quote from John Taylor who spoke about this land. He said, the day is not far distant when this nation, the United States of America, 
will be shaken from center to circumference. And then will be fulfilled that prediction to be found in one of the revelations that those who will not take up their sword to fight against their neighbor must needs flee to Zion for safety. And they will come saying, we do not know anything of the principles of your religion, but we perceive that you are an honest community. You administer justice and righteousness, and we want to live with you and receive the protection of your laws. But as for your religion, we will talk about that some other time. Will we protect such people? Yes all honorable men. The city of Zion, New Jerusalem, will also be what I would describe as one of the only continually advancing places left on the earth in all different spheres of life and learning. John Taylor at another time said, we believe that we shall rear splendid edifices, magnificent temples, and beautiful cities that shall become the pride, praise, and glory of the whole earth. We believe that this people will excel in literature, in science, and the arts, and in manufacture. In fact, there will be a concentration of wisdom, not only of the combined wisdom of the world as it now exists, but men will be inspired in regard to all these matters in a manner and to an extent that they have never been before. And we shall have eventually, when the Lord's purposes are carried out, the most magnificent buildings, the most pleasant and beautiful gardens, and be the most healthy and intellectual people that will reside upon the earth. Gosh, don't you want to be a part of that? I certainly do. It sounds like a haven, and that certainly is what it will be. Harkening back to the Doctrine and Covenants section 45 verses, we also read that the glory of the Lord shall be there, meaning that the Lord's very presence will be there. The Lord will visit his people before the actual second coming of the Lord. If there's an opportunity for me to somehow be near the actual presence of my Savior, then there's nowhere else that I personally would want to be. And finally, I mentioned before that this city will be a parallel to the city of Enoch, but not for long, because this is also where there will be a reuniting of the city of Jerusalem and the city of Enoch. We read about this in Moses 7, where it says, And righteousness will I send down out of heaven, and truth will I send forth out of the earth to bear testimony of mine only begotten, his resurrection from the dead, yea, and also the resurrection of all men. And righteousness and truth will I cause to sweep the earth as with a flood, to gather out mine elect from the four corners of the earth and unto a place which I shall prepare and holy city, that my people may gird up their loins and be looking forth for the time of my coming. For there shall be my tabernacle, and it shall be called Zion, a new Jerusalem. And the Lord said unto Enoch, Then shalt thou and all thy city meet them there, and we will receive them into our bosom, and they shall see us, and we will fall upon their necks, and they shall fall upon our necks, and we will kiss each other. I think that when that day comes, we will feel such a special kinship with the people of that ancient, wonderful city, because we will have done a similar work. We will have built up in majesty and glory and goodness, magnificent cities in the name of our Savior and for his purposes, and we will do so surrounded by evil surrounded by wickedness and in spite of all of those things we will come off conqueror against our enemies and be raised up spiritually and eventually physically by the savior put me down for building new jerusalem i am all about it okay moving on sign number three the lost 10 tribes will return There are different interpretations of this. There are many different theories as to where the lost 10 tribes are and how they will return. There are two things in particular that I wanted to note. The first off is that we are seeing a limited gathering of the 10 tribes right now. 
I call to mind Sister Wendy Nelson's experience that she related during the Hope of Israel address that she and President Nelson gave to the church. I wanted to read it just briefly. She says, We often talk about living in the latter days. We are, after all, latter day saints, but perhaps these days are more latter than we have ever imagined. This truth became a reality for me because of what I experienced during one 24 hour period of time that commenced on June 15, 2013. My husband and I were in Moscow, Russia. While President Nelson met with priesthood leaders, I had the privilege of meeting with nearly 100 of our sisters. I love our Russian sisters. They are spectacular. When I stepped to the pulpit to speak, I found myself saying something I'd never anticipated. I said to the women, I'd like to get to know you by lineage. Please stand as the tribe of Israel that represents the lineage declared in your patriarchal blessing is spoken. Benjamin, a couple of women stood. Dan, a couple more. Reuben, a few more. Naphtali, more stood. As the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were announced from Asher to Zebulun, and as the women stood, we were all amazed with what we were witnessing, feeling, and learning. How many of the 12 tribes of Israel do you think were represented in that small gathering of fewer than 100 women on that Sunday in Moscow? 11. 11 of the 12 tribes of Israel were represented in that one room. The only tribe missing was that of Levi. I was astonished. It was a spiritually moving moment for me. Immediately after those meetings, my husband and I went directly to Yerevan, Armenia. The first people we met as we got off the plane were the mission president and his wife. Somehow she had heard about this experience in Moscow, and with great delight she said, I've got Levi. Just imagine our thrill when my husband and I met their missionaries the next day, including an elder from the tribe of Levi who happened to be from Gilbert, Arizona. Now, when I was a little girl attending primary in Raymond, Alberta, Canada, I learned that in the last days before the second coming of the Savior, the 12 tribes of Israel would be gathered. That truth was thrilling to me and at the same time quite overwhelming to wrap my mind around. So imagine what it was like for me to be with members of all 12 tribes of Israel within one 24-hour period. That is amazing. That is the work that we are doing right now. We are finding the lost posterity of our family. Now, in addition to this, there is also a group of 10 tribes that the Lord has led away. He talks about this extensively in many of the prophecies had by Old Testament prophets that we will study at the end of this year, and also in the Book of Mormon and in several of the Isaiah chapters that Nephi includes in his writings. The Lord knows where he has taken them. And in time, he will restore them. And they will serve as a strength to the saints at that time. It will be empowering and strengthening for us and will bolster our numbers when they return. About this miraculous return, we read in Isaiah, And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads, and they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. In Jeremiah we read, Behold, I will bring them from the north country. And gather them from the coasts of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and her that travaileth with child together. A great company shall return thither. They shall come with weeping, and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. There are also numerous scriptures that seem to denote the way that the Lord will bring them back. In Doctrine and Covenants 133, we read, And they shall smite the rocks, and the water shall flow down at their presence, and an highway shall be cast up in the midst of the great deep. These things, I think, tend to be beyond our present understanding or even our present imagination. 
What I have heard and what I can say is that there will come a time that when people are caused to think of the miracles of the Lord and the mightiest works he has ever performed, that they will no longer look to the exodus of the Jews out of Egypt as the most miraculous deliverance he has ever provided. And think about that, the exodus, a million people, men, women, children, who had been slaves, who had limited knowledge, limited experience because of that, that were led by a prophet of God who split a sea so that the waters parted and that they were able to escape their enemies on dry ground. Essentially, those people were cornered and to deliver his people, the Lord took down a wall. And yet, the time will come when we will not cite that as the most miraculous delivery of the Lord. Instead, we're going to look to this. We're going to talk about the return of the ten tribes. I don't know what that means. I have a hard time picturing it and imagining it. The more that I study, the more that I see that the God that we worship is endless. He is powerful beyond belief. He is a creator of this and all worlds. And because of that, I stand in awe and amazement and in very anxious anticipation to see how he chooses to do this work. It is going to be unbelievably amazing. And again, we don't have a ton of the details on how he's going to do this, but we know that he will. And when he does, we will be mine. I'm so excited. (laughs) Okay, sign number four. This sign is not expressly stated in scripture. Rather, this comes from a prophecy of Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith said, Even this nation, the United States, will be on the very verge of crumbling to pieces and tumbling to the ground. And when the Constitution is upon the brink of ruin, this people, the saints, will be the staff upon which the nation will lean and shall bear the Constitution away from the very verge of destruction. Now, I am not excited for the destruction of the Constitution. I am a patriot. I try to be a patriot as Captain Moroni was a patriot, which is something that we'll certainly talk about. I have a firm testimony of the foundation of the United States of America. I know that the Constitution was divinely inspired and that God was the one who laid the foundation of this country. So I'm not at all excited to see that. The sad reality is that the fabric of our nation has seen many small severs for decades even a century plus at this point. I was reading The Cleansing of America by W. Cleon Skousen, who was a wonderful patriot and a fierce disciple of the Lord and covenant member of the church. And in it, he listed the number of provisions or changes or legislation that has been passed since the founding of America that were not really in harmony with the Constitution as designed by the founders and as inspired by God. He said, if the original constitution had been retained, there would be no income taxes, no tax returns, no audits, no withholding tax, no federal social security taxes. Taxes based on excess or sales tax would not be there. There would be no national debt, no deficit spending. The Butler case of 1936 wouldn't have been allowed. The gold standard would have been kept. The Federal Reserve would have been unconstitutional. No bank would be permitted to advance credit based on bonds or create fiat money and would only be able to loan on existing assets. The U.S. National Bank profits would go into a fund to cut down taxes. Profits from state banks would go back to states to cut state taxes. There would be no foreign aid. Poverty and crime would have been eliminated under a system of judges. Prisons would be minimal. Justice would be administered on the basis of reparation to the victim instead of fines going to the state or federal government. 
There would be no Medicare or Medicaid systems. All agencies would be subject to Sunset. And there likely would not have been several, he counted five, of the different constitutional amendments to the Bill of Rights. Now, you can make the argument that some of these things are good, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are the responsibility of the federal government. And I think that under the Constitution, a lot of these needs would have been cared for by other organizations, such as churches. In another way, our Constitution has been undermined simply by the changes to the fabric of our various societies. John Adams said, Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. So surely we can see that the more amoral and irreligious our people become, the less our Constitution is actually standing on firm ground. Unfortunately, this trend will continue until almost all of the Constitution will have been dissolved, destroyed, or altered. But the good news, the thing I am excited for, is that the faithful disciples, the faithful saints will be the ones called upon to restore the appropriate foundation that is the Constitution. Boyd K. Packer said, In my mind, for the Constitution to be saved, it does not require a few heroes of Congress, neither some brilliant military leaders rallying our defense against an invading army. In my mind, it could well be brought about by the rank and file of men and women of faith who revere the Constitution and believe that the strength of democracy rests in the ordinary family. And in each member of it. We don't yet know, as Board K. Packer pointed out, how we are going to save the Constitution. I don't know if this means that the United States as a country will be preserved and restored. It could also mean that the Constitution will be adopted and set up as the law of the land of Zion, and that that will be how the saints will steer the Constitution away from the brink of destruction. Either way, I am grateful and I am optimistic at the thought that this God-given form of government will be preserved and that we will have a role in achieving that. Okay, last one. We're going to keep it simple. This is Joseph Smith's translation of Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. For the elect's sake, according to the covenant, those days shall be shortened. The last sign that we are excited for is that no matter how bad things get, Those days are not going to last very long. We have the Lord's promise that he will not prolong the suffering and the evil that will be experienced beyond what is absolutely necessary. Instead, he will make way for a quick cleansing, an expedited sanctification process for people and for the earth so that we then can move on to the seventh day, the day of rest, the day of his reign, the millennium. I want to note here that there are other great events in store for us. I have said nothing of Adam and Ayaman, of the church's rise, that it will come completely out of obscurity, of a temple in Jerusalem and actively preaching to members of the tribe of Judah, to the elimination of poverty under the law of consecration and stewardship, nor of communicating with resurrected beings and angels and the Savior himself. I want to leave these thoughts with you with the understanding that I have said a fraction of some of the great things that we have to look forward to. I hope you know that and believe that and will incorporate that into your study and begin to train your mind to look for these things things, to look for the miracles and to look for the blessings, the amazing things that we have to look forward to as we participate in these winding up scenes before our Savior comes again. Okay, we have another book review. This time I'm covering 100 Signs of the Times by David J. Ridges. This is pretty standard, I would say, for anyone wanting to study Signs of the Times. Brother Ridges, I'm sure many of you are familiar with him. He's the author of the Gospel Studies Made Easier books. 
So we all have thrown a lot of money at him this year studying the Old Testament, I'm sure. He taught in the church education system for 35 years. He has also taught adult religion classes, know your religion classes for the BYU continuing education program, and he's been a curriculum writer for Sunday School, Seminary, and Institute Manual. This book is his latest iteration. He previously had published books that were 50 Signs of the Times and then 65 Signs of the Times, which I read a decade and a half ago. This latest version was published in 2019. I love this book as kind of a quick lookup guide or a really high level overview of many scriptural discussions about our times. It doesn't really go into deep detail with each sign. He doesn't have the room for that, but rather he gives an overview and then he tends to also provide some examples of the fulfillment of each prophecy. One thing that's really helpful is he does classify each sign as fulfilled, being fulfilled, or yet to be fulfilled, which can be really helpful for determining where we are in God's timeline of events of the last days. Now, he does also exhibit some really great how to begin teaching preach my gospel skills in the initial chapters where he sets some basic expectations for appropriately studying this topic. He does a good job of noting Satan's efforts to frustrate God's plan and things that we're seeing today, such as him trying to destroy valid heroes or pitting men and women against each other. He talks about how signs of the times are sometimes inappropriately used to frighten or panic people. And he also gives some discourse generally about the mark of the beast, the timing of the second coming, and whether or not all people will be caught unaware. He does have this one unique approach where he recommends not developing an exact sequence of events for leading up to the second coming, which is contrary to a lot of other scholars in regards to this topic. But he does a good job of noting how the Lord has left the sequence pretty opaque and how some scriptural accounts, when compared to one another, that give time estimations are somewhat conflicting. I found that interesting and insightful, that recommendation to not try to make a sequence of events. Throughout his book, he does a wonderful job of emphasizing the importance of allowing the fulfillment of signs to strengthen our testimonies and to serve as evidence of the truthfulness of the gospel, which I think is one of the biggest takeaways from the whole book, is that as we look at these signs, as we're seeing them come to pass, we can know that the gospel is true. It's super easy to navigate. Again, it's a really high-level overview of many, but not all, signs of the times. And it does a great job confirming that we are indeed in the last days. So be sure to check that book out. If you haven't already, you can find it wherever you find church books. So Deseret Book, Seagull Book, Amazon, whatever floats your boat. Okay, and finally, a little oil for your lamp today coming from Sister Melanie Rasband. She said... Our prophet is inviting each of us to be willing to stand out, step up more courageously, step into our role as sons and daughters of God in these last days, and be all that we can be and do what is needed to be done. My experience lately as I've been studying and pondering and learning through the Spirit is that the mysteries of God, including who we are, and why we are here, and what he would have us do, are in our power to learn. God wants us to go to him for this knowledge. Not Instagram influencers, or experts, or even just relying on the testimony of prophets, although those are certain witnesses. The ultimate source we should be turning to daily is God the Father, through his Spirit, by virtue of his son, Jesus Christ. We need to take this seriously. She's right. This is what President Nelson is asking us to do. He's asking us to boldly live the gospel, to step into our role in these last days, and to do the work that God has sent us to do. So my question for you is, what is the work God wants you to be doing? And who is it that he needs you to become? I testify that if you were to take those questions to your Heavenly Father with real intent, meaning that whatever he reveals to you, you will act upon. 
no matter how strange or uncomfortable or frightening it might be, if you are to do that and then seek understanding through the Spirit with the willingness to sacrifice and obey, you will learn to see yourself the way He has seen you. You will learn why it is He saved you for the last days. And then you will be blessed beyond your current understanding as you strive to participate in these, the last days, and in the amazing things that the Lord has in store for you as an individual, for his church, and for the world. I testify of that. Hope you all have a wonderful week. I love you. We will talk again soon.